Happy Holden has been involved in advanced PCB technologies for over 47 years. Throughout his career, he's built up a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience at well-known corporations across the globe. Mr. Holden retired from Gentex, one of the United States' largest automotive electronics OEMs, served as a senior PCB technologist at Mentor Graphics Corporation, and held the title of Advanced Technology Manager at Nanya, Westwood Associates and Merrick's Corporations. Happy also served at the world's largest PCB fabricator, Hon Hai Precision Industries, better known as Foxconn in China, where he held the title of Chief Technology Officer, and at Hewlett-Packard, where he managed PCB design, PCB partnerships, and automation software in Taiwan and Hong Kong before retiring after 28 years of service. Known as the father of HDI, Happy has published chapters on the topic in four books and authored his own version, the HDI Handbook which is available for free and widely used throughout the industry. And he recently completed the seventh edition of McGraw-Hill's Printed Circuits Handbook, along with Clyde Coombs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the father of HDI, Happy Holden. Well, it's a pleasure to be invited back to uh, Altium Live. Uh, like Rick Hartley said yesterday, it, uh, you know, the introduction may be a little overblown, things like that. Uh, if I was, I'll just quickly tell you a story. If I was as smart as uh, you all said, um, I worked with a, a technician by the name of Steve Wozniak. In fact, Steve Wozniak worked for me. And we had a club to make a, um, our own computer back in the um, early 70s. And, and, uh, um, and so basically this was the Apple I computer or Apple Zero computer. Um, and because it was HP parts on HP printed circuit boards, um, the intellectual property was owned by Hewlett Packard. And there's even a famous movie they made, I don't know if you've seen it, but. It, it's a great movie, try to get it somewhere, it's called The Pirates of Silicon Valley. And it's a great movie because it's appropriately named. All of us was always pirating ideas from everybody else kind of thing. Um, but in the movie, Wozniak has to take the computer in to Ray King, the division manager, to get permission to make this in his garage. And in it, he and his friend by the name of Steve Jobs made 220 of these for the uh, Bay Area Computer Club um, type of things. Now, there's several other secrets there and stories I won't release about Wozniak, but you, you ply me with enough beers tonight, um, I'll tell you kind of the real scoop uh, between all of this. But, uh, but they did offer, would I come and help them build these computers and join Apple Computer? And I um, faithfully said, I have two children and everything, and work for Hewlett Packard. You guys are probably going to go bankrupt. You think I'm crazy? So, um, you know, if I'm that smart, I would have taken the offer uh, and be a founder of Apple. So, uh, it, it's, it's all in perspective. I, I really thank, you know, the prior keynotes uh, and Lawrence and um, Carl and Lawrence and uh, Rick. Uh, a lot of the information they brought is kind of perfect for my topic today um, about printed circuit trends. And in particular, the first three, um, I want to introduce the smart factory. You Europeans know all about Industry 4.0 actually came out of Germany four years ago as uh, the fourth industrial revolution kind of thing. Um, and it's so all introduced. The, um, a smart factory um, that's the first in the world for manufacturing printed circuit boards. The second thing is the digitization of the PC board, or the role of CAD tools in providing the recipes that the smart factory requires. And then thirdly, how artificial intelligence could help affect those design tools. 
I will not be covering the appendix, like who's Happy Holden and, you know, what uh, some of my stories. I put that in the appendix. You can read that if you download the slides, but uh, we need to take time up with who am I because it doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, I don't know how many of you are here of um, heard about Wheeland Engineering. Wheeland Engineering is an automotive and aircraft lighting and sound OEM. They build emergency equipment. Most police, fire equipment around the world are Wheeland lighting systems. Um, community alarms in my own town, the first Friday of every month, the, uh, a, a siren goes off. Uh, I'm not sure, we don't have to worry about tsunamis in Michigan, but, um, but the siren goes off over and over. But that's, that siren that you can hear for hundreds of kilometers is, is a Wheeland product. Uh, um, so I'll briefly talk about uh, their smart fact processes, equipment layout, process controls, and, and actually give you a video tour of that. Um, what is unique about Wheeland, um, these are their products. That's on a tail of an airplane there, on fire truck, uh, police vehicles. Wheeland as an OEM, uh, in 2015, they're headquartered in Chester, Connecticut. Uh, this factory is actually in New Hampshire, though. Uh, as an OEM, they like to be vertically integrated. So I'm not sure what led them in 2015 uh, when they were currently buying all their PC boards from China, that they decided to manufacture their own circuit boards. Um, and somehow they got mixed up with um, a print circuit expert that's a real genius. And um, um, you know, wish they had called me, but this guy got the, the genius that proposed the whole uh, 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 idea of being a captive manufacturer of printed circuits. So they were building printed circuits, two-sided, multi-layer, and middle black flex rigid for the lighting markets and things like that. But one of the things that they decided to do was to use this smart factory approach. And, uh, and the, uh, you didn't start the timer, uh, Lawrence. <laughs> Uh, uh, but anyway, oh, the, you clap at that. <laughs> you know, the uh, uh, they Sa Sarah the, told me that it would stay on, Happy. So I'm oh, it's her. To go dark. <laughs> I'll give you. I'll give you a call out. Yeah, um, but one of the things that came up was apparently the opportunity with the smart factory approach to actually have a fully automated manufacturing that had no production workers, which. Um, we have elements of Industry 4.0, um, but we're still talking about the human-robot interaction. Um, this, this has no humans in it whatsoever. There are no production workers, hence no recruiting, no training. Um, those of you here that do buy from Asia know about the problem of the golden holiday in Chinese New Year's, in which 20% of, of the people that make your product disappear and take on new jobs and you have to run around and grab untrained people to build your products until they're trained. But every year, the Chinese population seems to switch jobs without notice to the companies. The second thing was that um, um, the trend was brought up the last two days that the role of our products are changing in order to personalized and capitalized on individual needs, um, they have an economic order quantity of just one panel. Um, so they will make 100,000, but they have the same price as one. In other words, volume is immaterial because the system is geared for an economic, the lowest possible price is one panel with that. Um, and that, that I should say cost is half of China. Um, um, and for quick turn prototypes, it's a one tenth of China. But remember, they can make one for the same price somebody can make a million of them. Um, and, you know, and in two days, delivery. 
One panel, two days, 100,000, two days. Um, that's just the way to, instead of six to eight weeks. Um, well, afterwards, I'll maybe show a little bit. The other problem is, is that every single product is perfect, about 99.8% yield. There is no scrap to deal with. Um, one reason is because they have 50% fewer manufacturing steps. Because there are no humans and nobody touching the PC boards, when the robots launch the material, and every piece of material is characterized to 20 gigahertz as it's received and put away in the refrigerated warehouse. So every single piece of material that goes into making that multilayer is characterized to 20 gigahertz and carries its own code that the robots put on it to put it away. So it, when it's shot into the factory, the database already knows what the stack up will be and this characteristic. Now, that simply did not exist anywhere in the world that they've characterized every single piece. And during the manufacturing, I'll show you, they will characterize every single trace on your board three-dimensionally. Uh, and the reason they do that is so that they can do a characteristic impedance of plus or minus 2%, because they, they will actually adjust the line width or the spacing and a feed forward control system to make sure they hit that plus or minus 2%. Right now, the best you can buy anywhere, plus or minus 10% to plus or minus 20%, but every one of their products are, are automatically plus or minus 2%. And the zero of fluid came from building in their plant in, that they already had in New Hampshire. The government said, we don't want you dirty printed circuit plants in our state. And they said, how about if we use no water and, and, and admit nothing. They said, fine. So they're the only people in the world to have a government document indicating that they do not need a waste permit or water permit. Um, they recycle all their water and almost 70% of all their chemicals. Fortunately, this also means that um, their costs, that's one reason why they're half the price of China. Everybody else has to throw the chemicals away and pay for treatment in it fluent, they've done the next step. They measure them and regenerate them and use them again instead of throwing them away. So I, I like to call them lean and green. Uh, uh, they are the, the perfect example of this. So this is the, the Wheeling Manufacturing Campus in Charleston, New Hampshire. It's out in the middle of the forest somewhere. Um, uh, I'm obliged to say that we have uh, videos of this, and our, our, the lightning struck one day when we were out there, and our poor drone kind of got the byproduct. We had to go find it, because it fortunately made a, a soft landing in a parking lot, not away in those trees and forests for the hunted town. It's a very expensive drone. Uh, we didn't want to lose it. Uh, but, but those drones provide the video you'll see soon. Um, I, you don't have to read this, but just say, one of the things they've done is, no matter what you know about print circuit manufacturing, they have 50% fewer steps than normal because they have no humans, and there is no delay. Once that robots launch the material, that goes through manufacturing, and it never stops until it's shipped, tested and shipped. There is no place for it to accumulate and rest. And now, some of the, they have a lot of right angle turns, because if you're doing uh, multi-layer, you know, they got to collect the inner layers before they laminate them. But if you're doing HDI and you've got three build-up layers, then it, it'll go around and around three times before it gets to the shipping point. But like I said there, once the, the material storage system, 205 minutes later from drill and test, it ships. And it, that's plus or minus millisecond. It, you know, there are, there's no way to hold it. It, it moves out. It has very sophisticated uh, accumulators to accumulate all the differences you may have in material, because can, they can go from five micron thick copper foil to four ounce copper foil. Um, and yet, the etcher can etch all of those thicknesses simultaneously. 
Um, so I don't want to get by track by telling you too many of the, the secrets or, or how this thing is a smart factory, but it's extremely smart in that it has equipment that no human could operate. Because um, the etcher alone has 15 zones within the etcher based on the panel. So as that panel moves through it, all the chemistry and pumps change to follow. So this panel right here may have four times the copper of this panel right next to it, and yet they're all gonna be etched in the same amount of time. Um, I've never seen a machine like that, but it's, but it's not suitable to be ran by a human, because you constantly would have to adjust 20 or 30 knobs, and the human just, um, the sensors do it, and the digital pumps do it, but it, there is no human equivalent to this kind of manufacturing. Um, here's an overview, just some of the, the numbers. Panel plate copy, 75 microns. Um, um, thickness from 0 0.05 millimeter, thin cores up to 8 millimeter thick products. Um, and um, choice of five final finishes. Um, and like I say, when you see this drone, they had to turn the lights on for us to, to make this drone because there's nobody there. Um, there are technicians and um, things like that, but there's nobody in the factory um, except um, these 17 technicians that work during the week and, and, and double check on machines. Um, these are just quickly some of the different kinds of equipment and processes. You'll see these in the, in the video. It's kind of a, a quick layout, because most of the process it comes in at station number one and goes all the way out to station number um, 38. After 38, final fabrication and ship, um, in which automatic guided vehicles will take it over to the mechanical area and the test area, and then it will ship. Uh, one of the reasons why the yields are so high is that every single chemical within that factory is constantly analyzed. Um, so it's not people taking samples once a week, once a day. No, there's, there's every, every second or two, um, this nice German equipment over here on the right automatically analyzes these chemicals, puts it in the database, and all these chemical dosing machines control that chemistry into that bottom little kind of gold one. Very thing. Instead of your chemistry is going up and down and up and down, which the yield to the yield loss, this thing is steady state, you know, all the time. That also makes it easier to do the recycle of the, of the chemistry. Um, another area that's a, this smart factory is software from the UK that uses the inline automatic optical inspection and X ray to characterize every single piece of material and every panel going through. And then it learns from this, and it predicts what's going to happen, and it feeds forward to imaging and things like that. So no two images are every identical, because slight changes in drill registration, or placement, and things like that causes every image to be uniquely just to that side, which no other people in the world have that kind of capability but it leads to, to perfect registration for every board. Um, and then it also provides predictive algorithms um, so that things that will happen in the future, like inner layers, come from the history of the past. Uh, the zero affluent comes from a brilliant system of collecting the water, uh, putting it together. And one of the reasons they do, they've elevated all the temperature of all the liquids to create more evaporation of water. And they evaporate more water, so they have an inline static rinse, you see, after an inline process that can collect and feed that back in just to make up water loss. Um, so they actually use about 500 gallons of water a day because of evaporation. Um, but that doesn't, but nothing comes out the back except a a 68 to 80 percent solids, it kind of looks like sand, um, that's perfectly harmless, that goes to the a, a standard dump. Uh, that's um, that, and I'll show you later. 
The other thing they put out is sheets of copper. And so part of the chemical regeneration, uh, again, the only one in the world that takes all of these chemicals and regenerates them so they don't have to buy more chemicals, but so they're consistent. And since they're making multilayers of various copper thicknesses, they etch more copper than they ever plate. Um, and so although they're making copper for their plating operation, the excess copper comes out as pure copper sheets that they sell on the scrap market. It does not go down the rinse water like every place else in the world. But it gets sold as copper metal. And if any of you are interested in liquid liquid ion exchange, um, I hold the patent on it that they use. So they were surprised to find out that I knew exactly their formulation, which is a top secret, simply by smell, because <laughs> I was walking through the factory. Two different times I spent an entire week there, and they didn't want to show us everything. But like I said, I just walked by it, 18% <laughs> kerosene. You're using Lick 65. And <laughs> there's only three people in the entire corporation that know that secret. How, how can you know it? Because I have the patent on it. And, uh, and you bought it from the Swedes, didn't you? Yes. OK, that's who we sold the patent to. <laughs> That, that's why I'm not necessarily always invited back, because as a, I appeared there as a journalist, and journalists aren't supposed to know these things. It just happens that I'm retired. Um, so I'm retired to being a journalist, but I had to be a technologist before I was a journalist. And so uh, um, let's see a, a quick two-minute one of the original 2015 plan. There we go. Okay, so it's uh, 2017. They've been running this plant for two years. Um, they have already paid off all the investments in the savings and not buying cheap PC boards from China. So the president of the company said, this is a good deal. How can we cash in on this? Um, and the thing came up, well, let's make print circuit boards for everybody else that wants the quality and the technology and the rapid time to market. Um, so in 2018, they get the money to build a plant 10 times larger, but not just 10 times larger, for state-of-the-art military, aerospace, and medical um, customers. 
So now we're talking about really, really sophisticated PC boards that cost fortunes. Um, and instead, it's going to be put in while they're still manufacturing boards for themselves and, it, and switching, but a much, much larger facility. And the new facility has over 120 of these barcode recorders because they customize every single panel. Like I said, um, every single panel could be different. It could be somebody's prototype of one panel. It could be a medium production run of 50 panels. It could be a high volume run of 10,000 panels. It doesn't matter. They all cost the same. They all go through the same process, use the same materials. But they have this enormous big database of how this thing is built. And interesting enough, they're considering letting the customers watch it and see it in real time um, at wherever they, the, the customer is, because um, this thing is being constantly monitored by the computer. And there are ways for um, customers to actually see their board being built and see being shipped or tested in that. Um, one of the interesting things that because they are, uh, they actually have five plating processes, which they consider the, the heart of manufacturing printed circuit boards is the plating. So everybody may have one or two, they have five. And three of the fives are what we call semi-additive, SAP. And that's because their geometry goes down to four micron lines and spaces. So uh, I'm metric, this is four micron, not four mil. Um, and you can see there that the lines and spaces for these different uh, processes, 35 micron, 30 micron, 20 micron, and 9 to 12 micron. So depending on what state of the art you're working at, uh, they may have clad, but they may start with, with no metal on the surface, um, some processes that only a few may be aware with, in order to be, make it like silicon is so flat that we can image and create semiconductor tolerances on a printed circuit board. Um, and not just that, but they have a relatively unique stencil filling system that can fill any kind of hole, the example here, um, and it can be selective via fill. Again, not touched by humans. This is all done by the intelligent machines and things like that. Um, and they will measure every single trace on your board. Every individual net is characterized individually by some what they call inline confocal microscopy and white light interferometry. And uh, that's from the semiconductor. This is semiconductor equipment being used to make printed circuit boards. And so um, like that thing shows, they know every single trace on your board. So if you're doing precise transmission lines, they know exactly what it looked like. And they will feed the machines ahead of time to make sure that this thing comes out at the crosstalk or the impedance that you want within a tyrant, a tolerance that you've never ever seen or are allowed to have before. Um, this is kind of some of the, the machines now, you'll be happy to know all this equipment comes from Europe. In their opinion, the best in the world is made in Europe. There are no Japanese, no American, no Chinese products here. It's all European. Now, it could come from Italy, Spain, Germany, Switzerland. The imager up there is from Swiss. It's the first time a wafer fab imager has been used in printed circuit manufacturing, but it's one reason why they can do four micron. Now, that's detuned from the semiconductor in order to make it faster. But uh, and you probably recognize some of the other names that are up there um, from here in Germany and things like that. Um, and the, the facility is much, much larger in, in terms of its layout. Uh, but that, uh, well, that guy, it didn't. Laser doesn't work too well, does it? No, it's kind of weak, it won't show. But anyway, one of the ones up there is the robotic refrigerated warehouse. So all the material is stored in, 
a refrigerated automated warehouse and the robots pull all the materials that make up your bill of material to make these things. Each piece is labeled, puts it together in a sealed container with an RFID tag, and then until it's actually had some other image, the RFID tag direct the, the sequence through the factory. And so uh, this one, the case of Smart Factory, this is actually from the chief engineer and vice president of presentation he made to the IPC at Apex. Um, so he's saying 24-7 automation, you know, of this kind of investment per unit and 5% annual maintenance, um, this has a one to two year return on investment, even in Europe, places like that. Um, reduction in handling scrap on top of the direct labor savings, new handling system with auto adjusting arms, capable of handling uh, 0.015 millimeter to eight millimeter thick material, up to eight kilograms per panel, uh, and diverse sizes. Uh, and the new system has a smart buffer because it can build all of your products and you know that you're quite a bit different to your products. So it has smart buffers that when one or two of your panels may come through, it stores them until it kind of gets enough to load the machine and then the machine parameters and only those ones come by. So this thing is kind of like an army of production workers, but there's not an army there, there's smart buffers instead. And again, another slide from, the, from Alex, the chief engineer. Um, key benefits, ability to build complex, uh, three build up, four build up in, in days rather than months. And the, from the warehouse to layup cycle time is two hours for inner layers and 105 minutes cycle time for copper plating. Um, and then ships, that's it. We're not talking about weeks or days. We're talking about hours. We're talking about minutes to manufacture these printed circuit boards. Uh, scalability of operations due to severely reduced regulatory burdens. They have no water permit. They have no affluent. They can build anywhere because they, uh, they don't emit anything. Um, so they're free to build a factory anywhere in the world. They don't need to hire workers, so don't need to worry about training the workers or things like that. Traceability. Um, these things exceed any kind of military aerospace because every single step, every single piece of material is traced all the way back to a particular computer code that they can give you in terms of when was it built and what happened to it. Uh, and capability. The machines are actually learning as they build these things that provide predictive modeling use to achieve even tighter tolerances in the future as the machines learn to become smarter um, with it. And so this really sounds great. Um, I'd like to say there's one now in the world, but in my final statement, the company plans on building more in the United States and a, a couple in Europe. So um, if technology is not adopted here for that kind of smart factory, it'll be coming soon. But there is a downside to this. So let me tell you the bad news with it. And the bad news has to do with CAD tools, but not necessarily, it has to do with data standards. So the digitization of the smart factory depends on digital recipes for everything. My company had a 73 page manufacturing spec book. Well, if we were to use a smart factory, that 73 pages of manufacturing specs would have to be all digital recipes to use the smart factory because there's nobody there to interpret that 73 document. So I want to talk about IPC 2581, IPC 2591, and digital recipes. So the present PCB perspective in Hewlett Packard um, is that um, customer data comes in all languages, all types of specifications, and a lot of DFM is simply because of language. Um, this is one of the major problems I had in China, running the biggest printed circuit operation in the world, 
is that we built Japanese, Hewlett Packard, American, European. We built their products, um, but all of their specifications were in their own language. And translating that stuff into Chinese is not an exact science. Um, well, the, the smart factory wants it all as ones and zeros. It's a digital recipe, not a, a language. Um, so the front end tooling is significant. And so right now, design provide CAD files as Gerber 274X, ODB++, or even IPC 2581. Now, 2581 is the one that, that's kind of been selected for the smart factory. Um, because we've been going through a progression over the years from, from Gerber only to, like in the 1970s down to the 2010, there's only a few of those boxes that aren't green. Uh, and those are the ones that we still have left to turn into IPC 2581. But the focus of 2581 is to provide this data and processes for single XML files um, following a digital thread through the entire factory manufacturing process, from the CAD and design through component procurement, manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. But we've got a little bit of work to do. Uh, but what it looks like is that the CAD systems really have to um, output much more of these digital recipes that we have uh, that we can store and then feed into the, the smart factories. Uh, and we're still working on the IPC 2581 consortium, because you see over on the right-hand side, we're still in development of some of the this other ones. You see, we've got the specs already into 2581, but we're not quite fully there yet um, in development in, in these manufacturing specs. The, the biggest problem is the IPC. All of those nice books and standards you've been buying, they're not in digital format, you know? And so um, using IPC standards and specs is great, but the machines don't know what they are. And somehow those all have to be converted to machine understandable specification. Because again, this factory doesn't have any humans to read those specs and to implement them. It's gotta be in a digital recipe format. Um, so it's interesting that our biggest problem other than UL and regulatory government is the IPC itself. Um, but the IPC is rapidly working on the 2581 uh, data augmentation in order to combine that with the mechanical MCAD tools um, so that at the enterprise, we can have it for both assembly and for principal fabrication down here at the very end. Um, and we're almost there. Uh, these are the only areas left. Um, fabrication, drawings, dimensions, and tolerance, and other information is not yet in digital form. DFX measurements, technical queries, quality data is not digital. Notes in general, all of those notes that you put together and things like that, they're, they're in XML or printed documents, PDF, but they're not digital. Um, the machines don't understand a PDF uh, kind of thing. Acceptability requirements and certain material requirements. Um, but hopefully within a year, the, um, the committee will have gotten those last parts done. Um, and, and you'll see this kind of document, uh, unfortunately printed again, it's not an electronic document from the IPC, but you know the, uh, the XML schema, open industry standard for 2581. Uh, and with this, um, um, and the reason this is important is that what they have completed is all of the information for automatic assembly. So there's a new thing called the Connected Factory Exchange, 2591. This is a Connected Factory Exchange. This is an industry 4.0 free and open source plug and play. Um, and with this, it was published uh, this year, year in April, just came out. But it's a free open source standard. Um, and it allows, they use the protocol communication 
from the, the banking industry, AMQP, and the data encoding is the JSON standard um, to define the language and content of what they call the connected factory exchange, the CFX. Um, the CFX has all of these system information, material information, research pr and production, all these different files that using it, you can plug and play any assembly equipment around the world for no charge at all. And the manufacturer just need to plug it in and it knows how to communicate. So guess what? There are over 100 corporate members on this committee, including yours truly, Altium, but not just Altium, everybody that's anybody in making assembly equipment. Uh, and they've all been working together and it's taken them only two years to totally complete this standard. So it was done in record time, um, mainly because of the co It was, you know, they only started in 2016 with this. Um, and what the, they're doing is that the OEM in their design systems with 2581 will hand off certain 2581 files to fabrication and certain 2581 files to assembly that will be converted to 2591 and automation will automatically drive the thing. Um, so any of you can see this. Uh, they will be running a production line at Productronica next month. Um, they will go from uh, uh, a finished CAD design and when you walk over there with their smartphone, they will already be building the product. They're, it goes from CAD to manufacturing with no human involved. The 25, and um, at Apex in San Diego, we'll have two competing lines of all different kinds of machinery, but two, two different lines doing the same thing. And they also, in, uh, in the spring, they'll be at uh, Shanghai demonstrating it at CPCA in China. Um, so nobody's gonna get a head start on this, but the advantage is it, it's working. That smart factory for assembly is out there. Uh, and, uh, and so one of the problems is what have we not thought about? Like I said, when you don't have operators reading blueprints and setting up machines, everything has to be a digital recipe. Um, the creation of these digital recipes take time and evolve over usage. Well, fortunately, we have an example, and that is the semiconductor industry have gotten rid of operators in the 1980s. So they have a 40-year head start on us, and today's semiconductor factory doesn't have any production workers in it, only technicians watching the machines. Um, and because of that, we can visit semiconductor, and how do the semiconductor people handle this problem of, um, of complex data. Uh, and it's really because the semiconductor people are willing to share uh, their knowledge and experience with us. You might say that there are bigger, smarter, older siblings because they had a lot more money than we did and they started doing it a lot earlier than we did. No reason to reinvent the wheel. This is from an Intel presentation I attended and from hands-on to nearly autonomous. Uh, Intel talks about autonomous manufacturing rather than automated manufacturing. Um, and visiting the Intel factory in Oregon, yeah, the people there are standing around watching things for safety. They're, they have nothing to do with the production of 300 millimeter silicon wafers. It's all done by data-driven recipes. Um, so it's great that, that companies like Intel and other semiconductors have already achieved this long ago. Uh, and part of it is the whole digital recipe in the wafer fab, um, what it established, and it particularly established a set of protocols um, that we call GEM, General Equipment Manufacturing, um, and also machine to machine that are called the Serial Exchange Control System, SEX1 and SEX2. So these are the, this is what the semiconductor um, people have established and clearly uh, a leading way in which um, how we're gonna have to put together the smart factory in terms of how things work at uh, 
as you go down the, from manufacturing equipment to manufacturing equipment, things like that. Uh, the dilemma with that is this is not 2591. So, you know, we'll have some issues in the future that what the semiconductor has established is not what IPC is doing in 2591. But this can be driven by 2581. It's just a different post processor. Um, and so that's there's a, interesting. Is, do we follow the semiconductor industry or do we do it and, and strike out on our own? And so the, the final part of my talk is, uh, uh, my, yeah, it's on schedule, is, uh, is that a lot of these challenges all involve recipes and software um, that we don't have and that is going to have to be customized for every single one of your unique products. And uh, I'd like to kind of throw out the option of how artificial intelligence could affect design tools in the future. The first one is um, this thing, this journey to the intelligent factor. Um, this is a quote, quote, a slide from Intel. What this is, is a, a virtual prototype. In other words, before we ever start building or ever start designing the printed circuit board, we create a simulation virtual prototype model. And this virtual prototype model helps drive how we design the printed circuit board and how we manufacture it. But it's the first thing we do, not the last thing. So before you ever turn on your CAD system, you're working on some kind of, of virtual prototype system that set it into it what your objectives of design are, but what are the objectives in manufacturing and assembly for the performance of the final product. So maybe this is part of a program manager, maybe they do that, and, and not the first circuit designer, I don't know, but um, Intel is telling me that this is, uh, you know, how this smart factory systems are all gonna communicate and talk with each other. Right now, what we do is, you know, we design it and throw it over the wall to the next one, and they do it and they throw it over the wall, and it's hard to get that feedback communication which a number of speakers in the last two days have told you is that communication is really, really important, especially if we've done it the wrong way or we could have done it better, we'd like to have that communication so we can fix it the next time. Um, well, you know, the, the smart factory is inherently built that we're all part of building this and is not over the wall techniques anymore. And so one of the things I like to say is, is one of our speaker talked about was rules. And one of the things I liked on a, earlier in my life, um, I used a CAD system called Raycal Redact Visula. And Visula had a design advisor. And uh, this would allow me to capture my company's rules, but also signal integrity or power integrity rules. Um, and so, what it was was little widgets that sat on our screen around it. And depending on rules and the bar graphs, as we did placement and route and tuning, um, these little meters would go from the green to the yellow to the red. If we couldn't get it out of the red, we'd hit the undo to the one back to the green and then placement and route a slightly different way. Um, but we had a number of different performance advisors. Um, like you can see here, Rick Hartley's favorite topic, EMI. Uh, this design integrity meter was an EMC advisor. Now, you gotta apologize for this. This is about 25 years old. It's not, so it certainly is not Rick's current set of rules, but we could easily replace those rules with all of Rick's rules instead of whose ever rules these are. Um, the thing I like down here is that one button up there advice control. So if you can't get it right, you punch that button and you get some advice. And, uh, and so I talked to Rick, he said, no way will I take calls from computers asking for advice. Well, okay, um, we're gonna have to figure out how to um, pay Rick appropriately to give us that advice when we punch that button. Uh, 
but there is design reports and things like that. But this capturing the rules and this thing sitting on your screen in the corner to give you immediate feedback gets you away from this thing in which the manufacturing tells you this could have been better, could have worked better if you had done this and this differently. And all you can say is, well, if you had told me this three weeks earlier, I would have. But I'm, we've used up the schedule. I don't have time to go back and redo it. Why couldn't you tell me earlier? Which is why we say, visit your fabricator. But not just visit your fabricator, tell your fabricator about what you're trying to design. So if they have a problem, they tell you early. Well, uh, this kind of easy to use software add-on to a CAD system would really be great to kind of remind you that, oops, you know, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, we'll get rid of it. Uh, so as an example, at Hewlett Packard, we actually created a uh, design for manufacturable manual, 1988. This was the most popular book in all of Hewlett Packard. Printed 8,000 of these for design engineers, um, and it became the Bible. Um, uh, and the reason it became the Bible is that everything in, in it about placement, route, components, inductance, capacitance, material, had costs associated with it. We invented a currency called the relative cost index. And that's the currency that I'll show later, but it's not Deutschmarks, euros, or dollars. It's a ratio of what you're doing compared to a standard eight layer cost, which is 1.0. And so the, the number is a ratio. And so any and all choices, um, you have a little worksheet over here where you add up the RCIs, and you will know what this costs before you ever design it or build it. Um, and it's accurate within about 3 to 4% of predicting the actual manufacturing cost. So very, very popular because it's the one thing designers ask, if I do A, B, and C, which one costs the least? And nobody will tell you the answer. And we said, we can't have that. We've got to give designers the answer so they can do their job. And this was the solution. Now, the problem with this is that they wanted automated. They didn't want the book. They wanted it online. And so HP Laboratories in 1991 developed a software version that they called the Board Construction Advisor um, for many manufacturing manual uh, because it was help lower the cost while implementing the physical design. And this provided access to 10 different print circuit environments, schematic capture, parts library, layout, design goals, manufacturing specs, stack up editor, design documents, references, analysis, and past design comparison. Um, so this is what uh, the board construction divides look like. In the 1991, this was written in, on Unix workstations, because this is 1991 type of thing. And this is what you would actually see on your, your Unix workstation. The construction advisor up there allowed you to go to different things, manufacturing specifications or, or uh, things like that. Or, um, but first, you had to set the goals. So this whole thing had a goal setting in which you set the mechanical and electrical and cost performance goals for, the, for, for that. And these are little knobs on the right there that you can either type in or roll up and down um, in order to, because you can see right there, the bottom of the left hand cost. Cost was always in it, because in our thing is that um, yes, we had to hit the design goals, but we really got to hit the cost goals to be competitive. And, um, and so that was given over to the layout and design engineers that they control the costs. Who here believes that manufacturing set the cost of a product? Anybody? Okay. You're all that educated? Manufacturing never, never sets the cost of a product. Design controls 93% of the cost of any product, because the blueprints, the schematics, the design, the parts that you select sets everything in manufacturing. All manufacturing can do is control inventory and manufacturing yield.
but the blueprints on the materials and the components drive the costs. So all of you control the cost of product. Nobody else does. Not salespeople, not anyone, you. Um, and because you control the cost, you would like to know, you know what are the lowest cost options, but nobody kind of tells you that until it's too late. Um, here we're trying to get ahead of that by giving you control of costs in, in real time. Um, so material manufacturing specifications. You notice at the top there, density, complexity, yield, relative cost index. Relative cost index, that's the cost. You know, that's constantly reading out what the cost index is of what you're proposing. Um, here, we're talking about design class, holes, annular ring, metallization, solder mass, da da da, you know, on and on and on. Um, you know, this thing kind of works at, you put in assembly process, fabrication processes, you know, at panel, board, you know, all the way down. You know, there are recipes and numbers all the way through this, this decision tree. Uh, when you get to something like material, you put in here your goals for impedance, inductance, crosstalk, uh, uh, and things like that. You can select different materials. And the materials that are in there are only the materials that we have approved and characterized. Nobody is allowed to use any material until it's been thoroughly characterized uh, as electrical performance. And that doesn't mean slash sheets or data sheets. No, this means everything to 22 gigahertz, everything from uh, minus 10 Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius, and from zero relative humidity to 90% relative humidity. Every material that we use for electronics is subject to variation by temperature and relative immunity as well as frequency. And so hopefully none of you are naive enough to think that the data sheet, when they talk about the dielectric constant and dissipation factor, is in fact that number. It will vary, like the, oh, the prior speaker said, it will vary with frequency, it'll vary with temperature, and it'll vary with humidity. And so our engineers need to know what that three-dimensional space looks like when they're designing the product, depending on where it's gonna go. And don't tell me, we don't have to worry about that. Our stuff only operates in buildings. Some of my biggest problems in air-conditioned buildings, because what they do is they bring in outside humid air, cool it down, and the relative humidity goes up. And all the performance goes down because they didn't choose conformal coating, and the humidity is affecting the the dielectric constant of the material, and nobody bothered to tell them, oh, by the way, FR4 is heavily affected by humidity. Um, it is. And uh, it's not a question you want to ask because nobody wants to talk about um, the data that they don't have, which is how their, how their materials perform when the relative humidity changes or temperature changes, but it does. Um, it comes back with these diagrams, and it fills in all of the blanks about um, characteristic impedance, um, um, crosstalk, lateral and vertical crosstalk, inductance, capacitance, and resistance. Um, well, this parametric design generation analysis um, worked very well for my group to use and for experienced designers. But as we tested this thing out, we ran into the problem that if you're only a year or two out of the university, you were turning around and asking somebody else, what, what do I ask it next? In other words, this is great at giving the answers. How do, you, how do you know what the questions are? Well, unfortunately, it came from experience. And so we were almost going to declare this a failure until the scientists said, wait a minute. We think we know how to capture 20 and 30 years worth of wisdom uh, in a computer. Uh, and because they said they had that, um, we came up with a, a thing called Explorer. So BCA is the board construction advisor, but Explorer is, a, uh, as they called, a self-learning expert system. Today it's called artificial intelligence, but 1995 it was a self-learning expert system. Um, and Explorer, once you put in the goals and constraints, 
into this, filled out the board construction advisory, this thing would start to loop around their um, designing printed circuit boards. Um, and it would look at historic designs as well as new designs. I, IPDA is a world-class three-dimensional field solver that we've never allowed the public to see. And so whatever you have, what I had 25 years ago is much better than the most money you can possibly spend. Um, and it's still not available to you. Uh, um, but IPDA was just miraculous in what it could do with the three-dimensional field solving that we kept secret now for 40 years. Um, that, sorry guys, companies have their secrets. And certain software is not licensed or given away to anybody kind of thing. Um, but I think that y you can get close enough that it's not that important that it be. Don't get free, at Hewlett Packard, we, we designed to 300 gigahertz 25 and 30 years ago because we had to build the test machines for the radars. Um, so whatever radar, whatever coming telecom, tested on our equipment had to be 10 times better than what you're using it to test for. So, it, you, know, you know, we had to be that much better to sell test equipment. Um, what I try to do here is try to explain how Explorer works, which is it was difficult to do. Um, as you input schematics, components, and goals, the big question here is goals. You know, what is this thing supposed to look like when it's finished in terms of goals? It stores these things um, moves around and, and goes out and calls in a CAD system and does placement. And then it calls in a CAD system and starts doing routing. And um, I don't know if we have the time to talk about how it routes. Uh, no. But afterwards, you can ask me, how does it do routing? Well, that's a lengthy explanation of how it, how it does routing. But it does this 500,000 times. OK? Now, this runs on a Cray supercomputer 25 years ago. Today, it runs on a really good workstation, which our Cray computer liked 25 years later. But in those days, it was a supercomputer. Now it's not. Um, but suffice it to say, um, when it was all done, the system could not tell us the best design. And so this is where the experienced designer comes in. It would take an experienced designer to look at, you see there, um, 14 of the top designs and all kinds of trade-offs. Which one of those really is the best design? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends on a lot of things that just no way the artificial intelligence can get around. Market size, what the project manager, um, how much are we willing to sacrifice in performance to save in costs? Oh. You know, that's, that's a, a, a tough decision that, that takes the marketing manager and the project manager and everything else to decide that. Um, like number 10 was the best design out of 200,000 tries. So all you have to do is click activate number 10 and the, the board is done. Um, what we would do today is we would activate the top four, send all four of those to the smart factory in New Hampshire, have them all built on one panel, assemble all four, and then test the finished prototype, then which of these four designs for exactly the same are really the best? And what typically happens is, all right, this one is best to introduce right now. This one has the lowest cost. We'll save that for three months and let everybody copy this, and then we'll slip in this one at a much lower cost and crucify them for copying this one. Just as they geared up to make all of this, we'll zing them because we already have that design finished, ready. And we might have a third or fourth to, to ship out there if we really want to make sure that they lose a lot of money. Uh, but you can see that there's a long line of, of parametrics and goals in the parameter list, minimum, maximum, and enunciation number. Which one of the 200,000s is this that we could go back and look at? Um, and so, um, uh, but the, the other hard thing is it became my organization's job to teach this expert system how to design PC boards. Um, and that's something we'd never done before. Um, and so 
we made a lot of false starts. The first thing is, everything you've heard about artificial intelligence, you just feed it thousands and thousands of data, that's not gonna work here, because they're talking about facial recognition. We're talking about complex PC boards. And so we had to step back and how do we train a printed circuit designer today? How do you learn? So we fed it two connectors with traces. We fed it the simplest single-sided board, the simplest double-sided board, the simplest analog board, the simplest digital board, two-sided, four layer, six. And we fed it and it started learning from the very beginning at the lowest level, the way you would learn uh, and building this thing up until we fed it 200 different kinds of designs for microwave design, RF design, digital computer design, crossbar design, but all these different categories. And we kept these categories separate. These categories is something that is put in by the product manager um, because if the artificial intelligence isn't told what kind of printed circuit board it's supposed to design, it'll just get lost and, and not know how to get back. Um, so this is my last slide. Out of all this work, um, we, we were no longer in the design tool business, so we didn't turn it into a product. But we did demo it for all the EDA companies around the world, and they weren't interested in selling it. So the only history, if you want to read about this product, is right here um, at the bottom. This is published in the Artificial Intelligence for Engineering Analysis and Manufacturing, um, Cambridge University Press, Cambridge University, and it's called a Parametric Design Assistant for Concurrent Engineering. This is 21 pages long, written by these uh, four key PhDs that were program managers. You can see received in 1994, except in 1994, out of 21 pages, it only mentions PCB once. You know, and it never mentions that it designs PCBs out of all 21 pages. The reason is, to the scientists, the fact that it was used to design printed circuit boards is immaterial compared to what they thought was the breakthrough, the self-learning art expert system was. And um, so be forewarned, if you get this paper, you won't learn anything about print circuit design because that wasn't important to the scientists. But, um, and today, you know, this is called deep learning, but uh, it's also not deep learning. So don't kind of get confused from those two terms. Uh, um, this is not going, but this was operating in 1995. And today we actually have, um, supercomputer chips from Intel or NVIDIA that are AI-based. They are specifically for AI work. Um, so I'm hoping that because of the, those chips, um, you have, and so OEMs like yourself now may have another choice for their PC boards, and that's the smart factory. Um, if you don't have it, it'll be coming soon. Um, uh, and that, kind of PC design tools need a planning and optimization mode uh, because of what the smart factories can do. And AI may, AI may come to the rescue, hopefully in time. But electronics will advance even faster than before. Be ready for it. Um, with, with that, you know, thank you for your time. Uh, and I hope that... <laughs> <laughs>